Houston. Gerald, thanks for coming in today. Thank you. All right, first of all, as concisely as you can, tell us your story and when it is you began to question whether your daughter, Janae, was actually yours. Well, um, last year I came back from a trip from New York and I was pretty exhausted on a Friday, February of last year, and I had to drive to Houston from San Antonio to her uh, birthday party. And I had this feeling in my head, this notion that Every, you know, my daughter was not my child, and um, it bothered me. So mm -hmm. when I got home, I explained it to my wife, and, you know, I kind of got teary-eyed. I cried. Of course. And uh, it did cause a little pain. It, I just didn't know what it was. I, the thought was that she was not my child, so she just said, well, you're tired. Mm -hmm. And um, so I waited. I did make the trip to her party, and I called her and let her know. But then I waited a week and talked to my ex, and she confirmed that, she was my child, and I put it under covers. I put an end to it. But two weeks later, my sister and my mother came to visit and um, asked me the same question from a rumor that took place on my sister's job where my ex worked. And then when I had my daughters for spring break, I uh, took her to get a DNA test, and sure enough, it confirmed what I um, had already knew, and it was shown to me before I even got to the lab. Let me, let me stop you there. How is it you were able, how did you explain this to your daughter that you were going in to have DNA testing? That must have been really tough. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too thrilled about the way I had to do it. Uh, she had a sore throat, which was fortunate for me because I had to take her to the doctor, which I would normally do anyway if anything is wrong with them. So I said, well, we need to go take a test before we go to the doctor to check on your throat. And uh, she was okay with it. And uh, when she looks back on it, she knew that I had to do that to confirm the feelings that uh, she had as a child growing up, looking at my hair, my nose, my skin color, and how different she was from everybody else. Tell so, me a little bit about the, the spectrum of emotions that you experienced through this. I can only imagine. Oh, yeah. The, any man would be upset. Um, my first thought was to get payback or but I'm over that uh, it's been painful for my children my family but um, there are other people that are not really concerned about my child's life um, I've been at risk with her when I had my visitation for nine years and if something would have happened to her I wouldn't have been able to um, at the hospital to give her any kind of blood or tissue or anything let me uh, one final question for you what is your advice to other people who may go through this very same scenario um, try not to deal with it emotionally uh, paternity fraud is much deeper than just a genetic code of revealing a child and a father or who the biological father is but the best interest of the child is not the child support or mother support it's the life of the child mm -hmm. for medical history for their paternal fa uh, families and uh, in this case I don't know who her uh, biological dad's family is and her background, their background or whatnot, but I'm fighting for my daughter's uh, life. If something was to happen to her, I cannot help her. And uh, that's a big concern. It has nothing to do with uh, child support. Right. But one of the laws, none of the states require the mothers to disclose who the true father is. And if they don't disclose a father, they do not get uh, child support or any kind of government support. And that's the... Um, you know, the failure in our system right yeah. now. And I know that there are a lot of organizations, including Duke Dads, who are working to make biological parents accountable. Um, Gerald, we so much appreciate you coming in.